2001 A Space Odyssey is likely the best movie that I've ever seen. I got the great experience of getting to catch it at BAM, and it was so amazing. It is likely the most mysterious movie I have ever seen, and likely the most polarizing Stanley Kubrick film. Now, let me show you this, and then propose a question. When you say that, you probably think I, all I showed you is an edit of 2001, but I showed you something much more. I tried to tell a story with that, and I tried to tell you the plot of 2001. Obviously, this movie couldn't be so perfect without its dialogue, and I couldn't show you the full story of the movie, but I attempted to. You likely got a lot out of that, and instead of watching an edit, you just got to watch. Uh, what I attempt to show you today is to prove why 2001 is the best movie of all time. In 1968, Stanley Kubrick was a fairly well-known director, making movies like Lolita or Spartacus, two movies that were pretty well-known at the time. Kubrick never had any bad press, maybe a little bit of controversy when it came to the subject matter of Lolita. However, when it came to 2001, the most interesting part of pre-development to me is how it got greenlit, mainly because, I don't know. <laughs> It seems so outlandish that a big movie studio such as MGM would greenlight a movie with a 9.5 minute LSD trip. When it comes to the size of this movie, $10.5 million, uh, you'd, you would think that the movie would be shut down by the head execs very quickly, but they didn't. Here's the thing, this movie is one of the most visually brilliant movies, and was extremely influential for special effects. Kubrick presented the idea to the executives with as a visceral experience, and it sure was. Kubrick co-wrote this movie with Arthur C. Clarke, which brings me to what the most disturbing part of this movie's design process was. Kubrick has been known for some interesting task tactics. Kubrick mistreats his cast and crew psychologically. On the set of The Shining, Shelley Duvall was put through some very different torture to make sure that Duvall gave the full performance that she couldn't have been. Happily, they do not resent each other. In the same movie, Scatman Crothers was not happy with Mr. Kubrick after taking over 100 takes for certain scenes. In Full Metal Jacket, Dorian Harewood, or 8-Ball, opposed Kubrick on one thing, so Kubrick killed him. In, in the movie, in, in the movie. In 2001, A Space Odyssey, Kubrick was pretty nice to the cast members, but not the same to his crew. Co-writer of 2001, Arthur C. Clarke, was in dire need of money, 
so the plan was to release a book version of the film first so that Clark could make money. But Kubrick prioritized the movie. Take that information with a grain of salt because I heard it on a podcast, but I wanted to include this in the script because I thought it was so interesting. <sighs> this was before Kubrick had the label of perfectionist, so people had no need to be wary of him. But again, the, to the cast, he was very kind. This movie is less of an adaptation of The Sentinel and more a vision of what Kubrick was imagining. This movie is the opposite of the documentary that I'm making, because 2001 is more about watching something, as almost as if we are the monolith, watching the progression of humanity, and only showing up when you need to. Reading a book is the opposite of watching this movie, and that seems to be the reason that Kubrick screwed over Arthur C. Clarke. In the movie, you need to be able to watch something, um, and recognize it above everything else. I'm not saying that Kubrick wasn't in the wrong to take opportunities away from Clark, but I'm saying that there is a larger meaning to the movie than there ever will be in the book. In this section, we will go over the story, and if you haven't seen it, I would suggest clicking off. This movie opens with <laughs> the weirdest way to open a movie. The Dark Knight does something amazing, and it has one of the best openings of any film. So if I say that 2001 is the best movie in existence, it must have an even better opening. No. No, no, no. The thing about this movie is that it's really slow. Sometimes it can feel like a detriment to the pacing, but once you finish the film, you realize it was much better for the story to be slow than to make big bombastic openings. I don't think this that the movie should open like the Dark Knight in some form of action pass packed space heist. It would really kill the pacing in a detrimental way to the movie. I would I wouldn't be making a documentary about 2001 it being great if the pacing was back and forth. The movie opens with nothingness, a black screen with classical music playing for three minutes. Uh, I, I really I really like this movie. Then, you see the moon rocks, and soon enough, the title card is playing with the triumphant sound of Also Sprach Zarathustra. This moment must have been so interesting for audiences in the theater, because it was something that you felt like you weren't supposed to know about. The shot of the sun obstructed by two other objects is used many times in the film, so pay attention. We cut to monkey. Not your typical Space Odyssey now, is it? Kubrick used an actual monkey hide for the costumes, and similarly to the Cowardly Lion from The Wizard of Oz, the costumes could get up to 100 degrees inside. They filmed the scenes inside the sound stages at MGM Pictures in London, and the people inside of the monkey suits were mimes. 1968 was an era before green screen, so they projected a video of African terrain onto a sheet at the back of the sound stage. Uh, not so fun fact. Daniel Richter, who played Moonwatcher, was on heroin, was on a heroin high during the shooting of the monkey scenes, and that's why he seems to be more toying with the bones. Monkey Group A was forced out of the watering hole by Monkey Group B, and they went home and slept thirst. When they wake up in the morning, however, something interesting happens. They see a big black rectangle, and they begin to worship it. We will talk about this later in the theories section. But I believe that the monoliths aren't what cause human progression, but in fact show up only when human progression is about to happen. Moonwatcher discovers tools, and then the apes take back the waterhole. Then we get one of the most famous and fascinating jump cuts in history. From the bone, prehistoric bone, to millennia later, in 2001. Hey, that's the title of the movie! Um... This is a good place to talk about the monoliths. The monoliths seem to act in two different ways, sometimes as a warning, sometimes as a gateway. We will get to that later. We get some iconic shots, and then we meet, meet Haywood R. Floyd, an American diplomat who is being sent to the moon base. As I mentioned earlier, no green screen, so obviously no CG. 
They made small models and drawings that they would rotoscope across the frames of the film. And there was pretty much the only reason the film was greenlit, because the special effects were not only breathtaking, but they were also extremely influential, going as far as using the same CGI as Star Wars, which came out later. Anyway, when Haywood gets to the moon, he visits a dig site, and he finds a monolith. Spooky! They are about to take a picture, but then the monolith emits a high-pitched frequency. And then we just jump cut to 18 months later. Um, the Jupiter mission is a story about a rogue AI named HAL 9000 killing four crewmates, and then Dave Bowman killing HAL. This is likely the best of the four sections because it's the least mysterious and more about rogue AI. And remember how influential it is, because it was the first prominent film to feature AI as the central antagonist. The concept that HAL has a mainly human voice is so interesting, because most robots have a monotone voice. If I, were to if I were to criticize this section, this being the only criticism, I don't like how Dave doesn't seem to have much of a reaction to his friend being killed by the robot that is holding his life forces. That has to be terrifying. However, what, we also get one of my favorite subtleties of the movie. In, this, in every spacewalk scene, we hear the interior breathing of the astronaut's suit. But when Frank is cut off, it goes silent. Dave retrieves Frank's body, and then we get the most famous line in cinema history. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I can't show the full scene, but just, I mean, look it up. It's great. Dave breaks in through the emergency lock and kills Hal as he sings to Hal is just a robot who wants the mission to be accomplished, so his dying struggle is to show Dave the true mission at hand. Can we quickly talk about how cool this next title card is? Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite. What the hell does that mean? I think this movie is amazing! The, so the monolith floats around for a couple minutes, and here's the weird thing. So we see Dave's pod, and then it looks up, and Stargate begins. In the original script, D Dave apparently goes through a monolith-shaped hole inside Jupiter, and then there was an idea that Dave goes into the monolith, so what the f*** Stan? With a perfectionist like Kubrick, it would be really weird to omit something so important to the story. Then again, in the original script, there were little green men and narration. When I first saw this, I felt like a higher life form for thinking that I had figured out this movie when I first saw it. But I was so, so very wrong. Over the next nine and a half minutes, we learn what it's like to be on LSD. That's the most confusing thing about, about this movie. I can't even explain to you how much I wanted to throw up during this scene. Anyway, Dave is sent to this zoo of human creation in the most Kubrick-style room to ever Kubrick. And through a series of jump cuts and some odd things, Dave gets older in this zoo eating his dinner and sleeping. Then a dying Dave on his deathbed, and he reaches his arm up to the monolith, and he, and he evolves into a higher life form called the Star Child. And with that, the movie is over. WHAT THE F- So that was the breakdown, and you can tell through the writing in that last chapter that I really wanted to talk about my theories. So let's start with the obvious. What was the monolith? My main theory about the monolith is it's a device sent by the aliens to watch human progress. Somehow they knew the timestamps that humans are going to advance, or humans are going to use tools in a new way. The first monolith in the beginning shows up before the first humans are going to take over tools. The monolith on the moon shows up before tr tools try to take over humans. 
I love HAL 9000, he may be one of my favorite characters in media. A theory that makes the most sense, and is the agreed upon meaning of the monolith, and that, and that is that it's the cause of human progression. But, because HAL would have killed Frank and the other scientists anyway, I personally believe that the monoliths work more as watchers. Or the other idea that uh, monoliths are high-functioning aliens too. Um... And it is true that if there are aliens out there, they may they're, they likely aren't humanoids, and they could look like the body snatchers from the Donald Sutherland movie, or they could just be a chair. The other side of the, the theory is that if they are aliens, Stargate represents an actual gate between humanity and this alien zoo. And for Dave to discover it deemed him worthy for discovery. When he is sent to the zoo, it is so that the aliens can watch him. Uh, see how he experiences the world. This little theory section shouldn't be the shortest section, so let me kind of explain myself. 2001 is the most mysterious film of all time, but it doesn't exactly seem that way. For two and a half, for two hours of this two and a half hour runtime, it is very straightforward. Forgetting about the monoliths, it is a very basic space story, above average, definitely, but pretty by the numbers. Then. In the last 30 minutes, Kubrick flies off the rails and does this super colorful stuff and puts us through an experience, and then does some weird, odd jump cuts. Dave dies? Maybe? And then he becomes a space baby and looks at the camera, and then what? Or, I have the 2010 book, and I could watch the 2010 movie, but honestly, I don't care that much to find out. The movie succeeds at the mystery, and that's why this movie fits in so well together. I want to do something that I haven't done in my video so far, and I want to give the movie an actual review. Speaking of The Godfather, I will make a review and development hell of that movie. We're getting off topic, let's move on. Two thousand one is a movie that is not for everyone, and it's completely understandable why. I do have to explain why I believe that it's the greatest movie of all time. One very simple thing is that it was what I was told. For a little under a year, my friend told me that it's the greatest movie ever made, and I believed it. I decided I would watch this with that mindset, but I didn't end up believing that for the first act. Then everything tying together with the Jupiter mission and Beyond the Infinite, and it made everything worth it. I got a comment on my Shining video that saying, quote, I'm going to guess that Kubrick's most mysterious film is 2001, which I would love to hear you analyze. The cinematography is drop-dead gorgeous. Thank you for the amazing comment, and everybody who commented on the Shining video, all of those comments are so positive, and I'm really happy with that. Thank you. Um, and two... You're absolutely right. This film is a feast of the eyes. I can't stop looking at it. It draws you in, which makes some of these amazing scenes hit harder. I think if I uploaded the conversation between Dave and Hal and gave you my score for the film, you wouldn't even question it. Even that statement contradicts how good the film is. The build-up to that scene is super important, so it really discredits it. So let's plug my scores into a calculator. These are the 10 things that I rank this movie on. Number one, the cinematography. I'm gonna give that a 10 out of 10 for sheer beauty. Writing, 10 out of 10. I'm sorry, lots of dialogue enjoyers. I'm afraid I can't make it lower. Three, soundtrack, 10 out of 10. Number 4, Acting, 10 out of 10. The actor who played HAL 9000 straight up put his feet up on pillows to make him sound more relaxed. Number 5, Story, 10 out of 10. Wow, that was cool. 6, Pacing, 10 out of 10. It might have been a 9, but it works very well once it's over. Number 7, Direction. 10 out of 10. Com Kubrick might have been abusive, but he, uh, he sure made something. Number 8. Effects. 10 out of 10. For 1968 pre-CG, this shit looks ingenious. 
Number nine, action. 10 out of 10. I mean, again, it doesn't have much of it, but the action when it is on is great, mainly because it's so subtle. 10. Influence. 10 out of 10. I mean, come on. So we put all of the scores into a calculator, add them all together, uh, and we get an 100 out of 100. Divide that by 10 to get onto a 10 scale, and we have an overall score of a 10 out of 10. Good job, Stan the Man Kubrick. Well guys, I guess that's it. That was a lot of script to write, and it took a lot of procrastination. But now, it is done, and I've convinced myself that it's the greatest movie of all time. Ah, look, I even got a poster. Um, I have spoiled the whole thing, so you've probably seen it. I respect the hell out of people who don't like it as much as I do. I showed it to my friend Abel, and he didn't like it as much as me, and he gave it a 9 out of 10. I respect that he had the BALLS TO TELL ME THAT- I respect his opinion. The movie is odd, but anyway, watch it again to enjoy it more, try to catch it in theaters, and that's my review. With that, I am signing off.